okay, so you're part of the last Jim Crow generation, right? right? And I rem- you grew up, I with grew Jim up Crow, under the and Jim Crow. And I think your whole generation needs some I, counseling. I, I, Welcome to the Father State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. The Father State is our Patreon. So click the uh, Patreon link to support our work. And thank you folks in advance. I absolutely appreciate it. I have with me Dr. Kay Whitehead, and she is the Black Mama Activist. She is also an Associate Professor of Communication at African American Studies at Loyola University in Maryland. Dr. Whitehead, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here with you. Yeah, finally, I appreciate it. I know we had an interview set up before, but I got sick and we couldn't do it. Now we're here. So, Dr. Whitehead, what's important to you? That's a very good question. Um, As I'm sitting here mulling over what's important to me, I'd like to break it up into a couple of things. So, So, one, as the Black mommy activist, it's important for me to do the type of work where I can ensure that African-American young boys, young men can get home safely. It's important to me to make sure that my work is being used to open up spaces where we can have these conversations. Uh, Second, what's important to me is making sure that I make a space for deep engagement. Am I helping to facilitate conversations about the ways in which race and peace are used to help facilitate a conversation around social justice? As a Black mommy activist, that, that's not my full-time job, right? It's my full-time mission and my calling as someone who, along with my husband, helped to, to co-parent and co-raise two young men, but I'm also a professor at Loyola University. I I teach in communication in African and African-American studies, and I also founded the Carson Institute for Race, Peace, and Social Justice, which is an institute out of Loyola. So making space to have these conversations, whether on a personal level or a professional level, that's really what's most important. And when you say uh, for Black boys to get home safe, are you saying due to the outbreak of black on black crime you concern that when they're out there they'll get killed or hurt by other black gang members and things like that no i I actually push back against the notion uh, of black on black crime because there's a lot of of history around that terminology we don't say white on white crime we don't say asian on asian crime we only have that kind of terminology when it comes to the black community and it has a lot of stigma attached to it research shows that more crimes are committed within communities so as it's true for the black community it's true for all communities so no i'm not as concerned that they're going to be killed or shot or or maimed or attacked by a member of a gang. I won't say another gang member since my sons are not in gangs, but by a gang member. My bigger concern is the ways in which systemic racism work against African-American young men from stop and frisk to being uh, judged unfairly to the ways in which they move in the classroom and the stores and in public spaces and spheres. So I can protect them from, from other, from gang members by looking at what communities they go to and to. Are they in college? Are they out in high school? Are they moving in certain ways? But this perception of young black men being dangerous is not something I can fight against. Like that gets into the hearts and minds of people. And that that's a bigger kind of work that must Which be. Which are you more concerned about with your with black boys uh, traveling into communities and getting killed, robbed, or raped, or whatever by other black boys or systemic racism or police brutality or something? Which one are you more concerned about? Since we all know that the black on black thing does happen, and right now it's just out of control in Chicago, Los Angeles here where I'm at, Gary, Indiana, all over the place, which one are you more concerned about since now that they have defunded the cop and everything, the black people have gone crazy? Which one concern you the most? (laughs) <laughs> well, I want to unpack a little bit what you're saying, because I actually w- would push back against, you know, the black people have gone crazy. Like, you know, we have not gone How about crazy. gone wild? Actually, well, well, I would say we've gone as wild as everyone has gone. If we 
take a look at what's happening in society at this moment, not just within the Black community. There are more incidences of crime and violence and misbehavior across the board. It's happening throughout society. The last two years dealing with this global pandemic and people being shut in and all the messaging around that, we're seeing more uh, incidences happen when people are driving. We're seeing more mass shootings. We're seeing more violence happening within one another. So we know that that is taking place. So it's not that just black folks have gone wild. It's the same thing that's happening. It gets amplified in our community because it gets covered more. You asked me which one was I more concerned about, about them dealing with violence within their community. Since I live in Baltimore City, our homicide numbers have gone yeah. up. We are talking about the fact that we're dealing with a different pandemic here, not just COVID-19, but also the pandemic of violence. Therefore, Black folks across the board actually are dealing with a syndemic, which a syndemic is defined as having multiple pandemics pandemics come at you at one time. It's not an either or, it's an and both. So am I concerned about my boys moving into certain communities where I know violent crimes are happening? Yes, I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned about them going off to college and being stopped by the cops and they're just simply driving. In one incident, there's a chance that they might be harmed. And in another incident, there's a greater chance when you come into contact with police officers who have weapons. The defund the police movement as you brought that up, has been largely unsuccessful. Yeah. Like we talked about it and we marched about it and those who protested about it did. But if you look at the work of Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, of Angela Davis, of Miriam Kaba, the work to defund the police has not been successful. Right. So what is the problem? It's the fact that some cops have been involved in what they call a slow down work stoppage. So they get calls from certain communities and they're not responding. We have police officers who are quitting, not just because of, quote, the defund the police movement and Black Lives Matter, but also around not having to take the vaccine. That there are a couple of factors at work. Were you here. were you in support of defunding the police? In certain communities, yes. So if you were putting, well, let me be clear, in, in Baltimore City, if you're putting $54 million into the police force, but you are not putting money into setting up counseling services, setting up folks to come into the communities to help out, to set up a 311 call where if there's a problem, the police are not the first line of defense for a wellness check, the first line of defense when there's something happening in schools. I was saying take some of the money away from the police, not dismantle but reduce some of the funding and put the money into support services so the police don't have to answer every call from, hey, my son's going crazy to, hey, my son's cutting school. Like, are there other services that can support the police where the police are dealing with more violent crimes, but the day-to-day -day wellness checks could be done by other people in the community? And so now that they have defunded the cops and the, the young Black folks are smashing and grabbing, so they call it, they are attacking Asian people, they're breaking and killing white people, black children. They're like going wild. Do you regret supporting that at all? And do you believe that we need to refund the cops and bring them back? Again, I'm gonna go back to what the research is saying. You, you are saying that we've defunded the police. That was not successful. We actually did not successfully defund the police. You're, you're talking about black folks smashing and grabbing. You're talking about black. I mean, are you even aware of all the news stories about the rising rates in crime happening? Like, it's really interesting that this, this amplification of what's happening in our community, as if it's the only community that's seeing a rise in violent crime. It's happening across the board. The defund the police movement was not successful. The communities that were able to reduce funding have in the last year almost doubled the funding back from Chicago to Baltimore to Atlanta. They've been going forward, giving more money back to the nice. police because they're trying to find this balance. I'm not saying, and I did not say, nor do I believe that we dismantle the police. That actually is not my stance. I do think when you're giving a half billion dollars to the police and you're not putting any support services in place, that's not successful. It's not successful in Baltimore City, which is predominantly black. It's not successful in the Appalachian areas of Virginia, which are predominantly white. It's not successful out in the bottom in the predominantly indigenous communities. In any sense, is it successful to only put money into the police force and not into support service? Black children have been raised and are raised by decent black fathers and mothers who are 
married, would we have the same situation with the blacks? <laughs> I actually find that question so offensive, Why? actually. I, I'm not quite, yeah, I do. I, I'm just not sure. You mean decent black folks who are married, given the fact that research shows that black men who are not married to their children's mothers have more areas of involvement than white men. So my question back to you is, are you asking white folks the same question? Hey, if you had been raised in a different way, would we have the white child that went into the school and shot up the school? He had a married mom and dad who made sure he had access to a gun. He shot into a school. I'm so if you had a decent mom and dad, Cal Rittenhouse, would you have gone and done that? Well, you had a mom who gave you a ride across state lines and made sure you had an AR-15 to blow people away. The questions that you're asked, I think we need to turn them around and make sure we're asking them out as well. When I was because black when folks, I was, no, I'm saying you said you know, decent black folks who are married. I'm sorry, we have more involvement from black men in the lives of their children than any other race. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that people. study and I talked about it on my show. The, the black yeah. men have become like black women. They are doing the woman's job. They're, they're nurturing the child. They're feeding them. They're doing that. And that's not a normal state of being for men. And it's because the black men have been turned into black women. And the black women are out there pretending to be men. So I do know about that. And so that is still a weak state for the men, that they are now acting like the mama. They're acting like the black woman. I mean, this is just stupid at this point. I'm sorry. That, but that's actually <laughs> probably quite asinine what you said. The idea that, that I mean, to, to think, and, and, that's, <laughs> and I'm assuming, because I'm looking at you, as a black that's man, for you space. to think, Nurturing, I'm saying, nurturing a child, supporting a child, being actively involved in the life of a child is the mama's work. It's like, that is foolish. But men don't nurture, we men now, provide. But we, we now know, no, we now understand that it actually takes complete involvement from both the mama and the dad, if you just want to take it down to that level, who are both nurturing, who are both supporting, who are both pouring into the lives of children. Providing is not just the daddy's job. It's a job that belongs to both. If you're going to look at it from a biblical sense, women were also actively involved in making sure they took care of home. I mean, we can talk about that as a PK. We can go down that road. We can go back to the 1930s when men went off the war and women picked up the rod to make sure the households were we're moving together, we can talk about the fact that unfortunately in our environment, when we look at pay scales, even though black women are woefully underpaid in comparison to white women, and white men, Asian men and Asian women, the idea that you need to have at least one person bringing in the income level that's on par with their white counterparts. And we don't have that with either our men or our women. I don't think our men pouring into the lives of the children. I don't think that's weak, and I don't think when that's When I was growing world. up, uh, boys were boys yeah. and men were men. Uh, and this was prior to the civil rights movement and all that, right? The the men, the black yeah, men, boys and boys, the men and men. That, that the black action. men and women knew their role in like given to them by God. Child, please, you're making stuff and up. And now, now. You, if you're talking about the roles from God, are you are you kidding me? I mean, if you want to debate the Bible when it comes to roles, let's talk about Deborah. Are let's you talk a Christian? About let's talk about judges who are women. Yes, I'm and a so Christian. Do you, but we want to go down the road of the Bible. Let's go all the way back. Do you believe there. God in Christ, Christ and man, man over woman and woman over children? You believe that order? <laughs> I believe that there's a through line that God has set up with God as the head, and then you have the household going and in you that believe direction. But I believe also that with a man, that it becomes a partnership. The man is not there to rule over the woman. When a wife submits to her husband, submission, as from the Bible, does not mean control. Submission means to bring things into order. Households must have an Do you order. obey your I husband? Do I obey my yes. husband? Okay, so now let me ask you, what direction are we going in now? Are we talking about Black Mommy activists or my own well, personal you said, life? Well, you, you said, in my own personal life, I am a happily married woman to a Christian man. I'm a Christian woman. I'm a Christian mother. And I'm raising two sons as a Christian. That's 23 years. Whether or not I obey my husband has nothing to do with understanding what it means to co-parent, co-raise, and pour into the lives. I mean, this is just asinine now. Like, I think you're just making stuff <laughs> up 
could actually have the energy of making stuff up, maybe to get a rise, because you cannot tell me deep in your heart that you actually believe what I you're I know for a fact, you and without a doubt, unless, unless Black people return to the order of God, God in Christ, Christ in man, man over woman, and woman over children, it's not going to work. What? Okay, but you- but two seconds ago, you were saying, unless black children are raised by right. a decent mom and dad who are married. That's like- true, because when I was growing up, <laughs> black people were like a decent people then. And so they respected the order. They got married. What year did you grow I, up, I, I'm uh, 72. Are you, are you a baby I'm boomer? I'm 72 you're, right you're now. You're part of the boomer group. Okay, so you're part of the last Jim Crow generation, right? right? And I rem- you grew up I doing grew Jim up Crow, under the and I Jim think Crow. your whole generation needs some I, counseling. I, Y'all grew up doing Jim Crow. I grew Crow. up under the Jim Crow law, and black people yeah. were better off then because they loved God and they respected the order. If a black woman got pregnant out of wedlock, it was an embarrassment to the family. She would have to have a shotgun mm-hmm. wet or go and hide. But black people are not more like that anymore. They're just crazy. They are blaming and begging and whining and trying to take from the white people. And I'm surprised to see the blacks act that way because they were more independent. The blacks, because you because you know you're black too. When you're talking about the blacks. I think um, Mr. Jesse Lee Peterson, uh, as someone who grew up doing the Jim Crow generation, um, I am not sure what it is that that you are basing your belief on in terms of talking about morality, in terms of talking about how black people were better off then. I think that we've had some difficult periods within our community. And I would definitely argue that Jim Crow was a difficult time. For no, it wasn't. Folks. It was and not. The terror. Yes, it was. Because so all the research shows it was. I'm telling my own father. I should get my father on the phone to talk to you because I, I, I think perhaps you are not. In the good old days uh, when Jim Crow no existed, the black people knew that it was the Democratic Party. The Jim Crow law was about keeping blacks out of the Democratic Party and that all white people were not against black people. And as a result, they started, the blacks and the whites started the Republican Party because the Jim Crow Democratic Party did not want the blacks to be a part of it. Do you believe that racism exists? Okay, so let me start here, Mr. Peterson, um, because I think that you are confused um, and perhaps you're conflating things to to fit whatever narrative that you have. Uh, You started off with, it's like until black people come back to God. And before that it was blacks are wild and out of control. And now it's about what's happening in the democratic party or you're Republican, do you believe there's racism? Um, I think that, that you and I probably will not be able to agree uh, I find your comments quite inflammatory. What do you mean by that? Uh, and almost, yeah, well, I think that you're saying these things to, to get Are they not I true, really, though, what I'm saying? I cannot, I cannot believe, as someone who has grown up under this American regime, who saw firsthand the impact of Jim Crow on the lives and the psyche and the emotional state of black folks, someone who has seen- with But that's made of history. That, that's a rewriting of history. That's not true. That, no, there's no rewriting of history. That's not what we're talking about. We're not rewriting history. I said, as someone who grew up under Jim Crow, which you did, as someone who was able to see the state and condition of black folks in this country under Jim Crow, which you did. I did not. Did, no, that's not true. Who has been, you did. You cannot tell me that. So you never watched TV. You never read the newspaper. You never you never had any sense of what happened because you were growing up under this time. You never heard about lynchings. You never heard about Emmett Till. You never heard about the civil rights movement. There you never heard about incidents, the assassination of Dr. King. But- you never heard about the assassination of Malcolm X. You never heard about the assassination of Megar Evers. You never heard about any of that. I heard of those you things. You never heard of any of that. Then that's a I heard of those things, but it's nothing like what the blacks are pretending that it was. It's looked like the blacks oh. are using it to for personal gain. So I want to ask you. Using the civil rights movement for personal yeah, gain? Yeah, absolutely. How do we use the civil rights movement for personal gain? The worst gain? thing the that blacks. ever happened to the blacks were the civil rights movement. The worst when they thing did that, that ever the worst thing that ever happened to black people the civil rights, was the civil rights. Right, because what the, the civil let me rights tell you why. Movement. What the blacks did was sure. prior to the civil rights movement, they didn't have a leader over them. God was their leader. 
and the parents were the leader of the pe- uh, of their children. But what the blacks did, they allowed Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and all those guys to become their leaders. And and so they sold them to the Democratic Party for the vote and, pro- and, 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 and agreeing that they would be the black folks' leader. But blacks never had leaders before those votes. But I got to ask you this. Never had leaders before. I mean, the fact that you, in naming the leaders, you said Well, they're the black people leaders as a result of the civil rights movement. No, not the black. There were a number of black people who were leading. I'm thinking of Dorothy Ihai, who led the National Council of Negro Women. I'm thinking of Ella Baker, who helped to organize. Why are black people so weak? They need leaders. Why are they so weak? They need a leader. Okay, Mr. Peterson, I think that uh, we have reached an end. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, but I do not think we're going to agree. And I am very concerned about the things you're saying, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, but I think I'm going to discontinue Will you at least do my hot seat before you go? I have a hot seat. Uh, what's the hot I, seat? I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Okay? Um... True or false? Black people always late. Okay, goodbye, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. (laughs) That must be a yes. (laughs) Amazing. She put a tail between a legs and ran. What the? That was Dr. K. Whitehead, Associate Professor of Communication and African and African American Study at Lowell Marymount, University of Marymount. Uh, if y'all see her running down the road, ask her why did she run from the father state, Jesse Peters, all right? But she gone now. I didn't use a prayer for her no more. She gone. Anyway, I just like a real discussion, that's all. Support us. Check out our merch. Click the Patreon link in the description to support our work. And again, thank you for that. We are grateful for your support. And hopefully we've been of some help to you. And I hear from you all the time. My producer hear from you, so I know we have. So, But we got to keep it going. We must rebuild families. We must unite as Americans and not be divided. Divide, they're going to conquer us. And so thank you all so much for being a part of the Father's Day. Sorry to let you ran like that. I didn't know she was going to run. I kind of felt that she would, but I wasn't for sure. Anyway, let us hear from you. Don't, don't forget to ring the bell. Hit the like button. Uh, and let us hear from you. Follow, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching the Father State. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe. Support my nonprofit at rebuildingtheman.com and tell everybody and their mama about the show.